Good, so are we okay here? Yeah, fantastic. First of all, thanks very much for staying so late. I know I'm kind of uh, preventing you from the party and, and things kind of stopping you from attending the party. Um, wh what I would like to talk about today is um, how some changes that are happening now in the IT market are going to affect how we perceive software quality, what it means to have high quality software and how we need to work to get better software quality in the future. So, kind of when we talk about software quality, I think most of what people do in the quality space is actually figuring out the answers to some interesting questions and kind of informing stakeholders. And I think this is where the, ans the, the questions we are asking are going to change significantly. And the answers to those questions are going to change significantly. And that's what's going to really cause a change in, in what it means for software to have quality in the future or not. So kind of, when we talk about questions, there's five important questions that are kind of universal that we need to start answering. And it's kind of the, the, the overall, you know, who's done it, what happened, where it happened, when and how. And that's kind of a, um, if we get these five things answered, that gets us into a good mystery. So, Kind of starting from the first one, when I talk about who and, and kind of the question of who in software is very often who's actually using our products. Because for a long, long, long time, we were kind of working under the assumption that people are using our products. And we developed some interesting heuristics to test that. We developed knowledge how to deal with that. It's kind of 2018 now, so if I put an Umlaut, when I'm registering, I don't expect the software to explode. We've learned those things, but kind of who's changing our, so who's using our products is starting to change quite significantly. And in order to look at that now, I need to tell you the story about the most important bug in software history. And the most important bug in software history is a fruit fly that people don't often expect. So, so fruit flies are, kind of this universal genetic material that biologists like to experiment on to do genetic research. And um, there's a particular fruit fly or a book about fruit fly that's really, really important for the, the story of software quality. And that's this book, The Making of a Fly, by a, a guy called Peter Lawrence. So this book was published in 1992. And it's by far, as I said, the most important book for software quality in the future, and you're not going to find anything about software in this book. Because it's not what's in this book that's important, it's what happened to this book that's important. So, the book was published in 1992. Um, unlike today's publishing that's all on demand and all printed when you buy the book, book publishing in 1992 basically meant that somebody's going to print 10,000 copies. When they sell it out, it's gone, it's disappeared, it's sold out. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, kind of Amazon, when, when they started selling um, uh, stuff, they realized that they actually don't have to have everything in stock on their own. They can help other people sell stuff. They're a platform, like, like Simon talked about. So they opened up the kind of Amazon marketplace. If you look at kind of the buy, it says buy used. You cannot buy this book new. You have to buy it from somebody who already bought it. And kind of Amazon started with this idea that they don't have to have their own kind of inventory for everything. They can allow other people to sell stuff. And they allowed other people to sell stuff. And people like Professor Nath, who had a copy of this book, wanted to sell it in 2011. And at the point where he said, I want to sell this book, Amazon actually did not have a listing on this book. So he was the first one listing this book. He took a kind of a, a, a photo of the cover, posted it there. And very soon after Professor Nath started selling this book, some other people started selling this book as well. Now, in Amazon Marketplace, Amazon figured that they don't actually have their own stock and inventory of everything, but other people figured that as well. And they were playing on human psychology. And one of the tricks they were playing on human psychology was that people don't like to buy stuff from first-time sellers. They like to buy stuff from people who have a good reputation of selling because you don't know who you're buying it from. It's used. So there's an entire industry of companies that sell millions of stuff to other people, but they don't actually own anything. They price it slightly higher 
than the cheapest person in the marketplace. And what they do is, if you actually buy from them because you're buying it because of reputation, they'll go and buy it from the cheapest seller because people are generally good, like Dan said, and they will sell it to you at a slight profit. And because they want to offer pretty much all the books all the time, they don't do that manually, of course. Manually maintaining this is insane. They use a computer software to kind of publish this stuff. So there's entire groups of companies that are going to say, oh, somebody's selling this book. Uh, we can make a profit on this. I'm going to start selling it as well. Now, Professor Nath had a bunch of books to sell, and because he wouldn't be able to price them correctly, there's no marketplace for a book where you, know, you, you don't know how much to price, he used a piece of software as well that's going to price it so that it's the cheapest in the market, but not by too much. He didn't want to lose too much money. So if somebody's selling this same book for $20, he wanted to sell it for $19. Um, so what had happened is, Professor Nath listed this book in 2011, and this company called Bordy Books, their software woke up and said, oh, there's a new book we're not selling at the moment. We can start selling that. We're going to start selling it at about 5% more than he's offering it for. And they, they offered the price. Then Professor Nath's algorithm woke up and says, oh, somebody else is selling this book now. I can make slightly more money. So raise the price. Then Bordy Books' algorithm woke up and said, oh, we can no longer make enough money on this. We need to raise the price a bit. And this went on for about two days and ended up kind of in a price war where this started you know, this, you know, getting some attention from the media. After about two days, it ended as the most expensive book ever in history. And people started posting fake reviews on Amazon because fake reviews on Amazon are a thing. So there are people saying, oh, I bought this book when it was only 19 million. It was the best investment I had <laughs> and things like that. So the thing that's really changed here is we have heuristics how to protect against people using our software, but more and more, it's algorithms using our software, not people. Um, the IT industry is becoming an algorithm marketplace where you can get an algorithm for this, or you can get an algorithm for that. There was a big, big thing a couple of years ago with um, a company offering automated pricing on Christmas deals for kind of Christmas um, sales, and they, they were uh, guaranteeing that they can kind of sell out your inventory by giving people the best price for Christmas. And what they did is they, they, they kind of reduced the price to something like one pound for everything. That's a very good algorithm for a bunch of companies selling on Amazon. And Amazon was kind of holding that, that inventory in their warehouse because Amazon now does logistics. So a bunch of companies in the UK a few years ago sold thousands of mobile phones at one dollar a piece because the software optimized for selling. You know, wonderful, but not so much for profit. So we, we're getting this stuff where, where, where algorithms are using our software. And now, you know, we, 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 are, we need to develop a whole host of other edge, uh, kind of testing heuristics, boundaries, edge cases to figure out what we do with this stuff. Because algorithms can use our software in, in ways that humans would never be able to do that. And now you can kind of sit there and say, well, you know, this is silly, well, we are not an online marketplace, we don't allow people to you know, use APIs to do this stuff. Um, there was a really, really interesting case of you know, big, 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 big IT. Um, not understanding how the data or the, the, the kind of structures change once algorithms start using your software. And um, there was um, a case in um, 2005, I think, and this is where kind of how New York Times described it. So somewhere kind of you can see point number one, and this is all we're talking about two hours. Point number one is kind of volatility increases in the stock market. This is the US New York Stock Exchange. Volatility increases kind of, you know, we, we don't really know why, but it kind of increased. About 2.30, unusually nervous trading happens, and about three this goes down. Now, this goes down is actually about $1 trillion being wiped off the US economy in something like 20 minutes. So in about 20 minutes, the US economy went bankrupt, and then it magically came back like nothing ever happened. Within that period, uh, Accenture's stock price dropped to one penny. Um, um, uh, uh, Apple's stock price jumped to 100,000 per share. Some people made a ton of money. Some people lost a ton of money. And of course, you know, things like that are not allowed to go unpunished. So 
uh, what the U.S. government did is the U.S. government spent five years trying to figure out what happened. And what happened is the point number two kind of volatility increases unusual in some markets is they blamed it on one person. They blamed it on one person who wrote his own trading algorithm that submitted 19,000 trades to the New York Stock Exchange quickly and canceled it. Like, hey, 19,000 transactions for a stock exchange is not that big of a deal. But then what happened is at 2.30, other banking computers figured out that something weird is going on and started panicking. And when the computers of all the other banks somehow got tripped up by this, they started panicking and panicking and panicking, causing more panic and more panic. So this is the equivalent of a computer shouting fire in a crowded computer theater and all the other computers going berserk. Now, this is obviously insane. We had one person living with his parents in Hammersmith in London, causing all the big banking computers all over the world to start panicking. And when you have something like that, you know that that person must be a hacker, of course. So all the news agencies, when they showed his picture, they showed him with a hoodie. This is a hacker, yeah? So he's obviously to blame. So he got extradited to the US. This is Navinga Singh. And I think they tried to kind of uh, try him for something like 200 years in prison because he caused the US economy to collapse. Now, they're just insane. If, if, you know, if one person can send some weird stuff to a stock exchange that causes all banking computers all over the world to go crazy, that's not his fault. He's not hacking it. He's sending trades to an exchange that accepts trades. It's kind of all the other stuff that got tripped that's really, really weird. So kind of algorithms are using our software and, and we, we need to figure out how and, and what to deal you know, with that because stuff can happen in, a, in a far, far faster than humans can react. And th that's kind of the big change. So the second thing that um, is a big, really interesting question we need to start thinking about is what are our products doing? And there's a, there's a kind of sub-question to that that you probably have never thought about, but I'll give you a moment to think about. What is the color of big data? So that's a really interesting question. I think kind of data is like water when there's, a, you know, just a bit of data, it's transparent. But when you have lots and lots of data, when that's like having lots of water, then the color is blue. And that's why all the big data in news is always a blue background. I mean, there's never red, it's never green, it's kind of always blue. So, I, I, you know, this whole big data buzzword is now going around like crazy. And, and our products, everybody's doing big data, machine learning, and, you know, things like that. Um, and all the job postings are about big data, imaging, machine learning, and we're getting some really, really interesting advances in the technology there. There was a really interesting study at the Radboud University in um, the US where they have this standardized test for radiologists. Radiologists are people who look at images and figure out whether you have cancer or leukemia or something like that. Now, the best human ever on that standard I test did something like 73%. In 2017, they did a test with Google's image recognition algorithms. Google's image recognition algorithms got 89% correct on the test. So we have software today that can do image recognition on stuff that people train for 10 years to become good at, that's doing it, you know, 20% better than the best human ever. And that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing what we can do with this. Because, you know, th that puts in question a whole host of other kind of qualifications for automation. People are talking about how robots are going to take away taxi drivers' jobs and other unqualified jobs. Robots are taking away jobs of people who have to study for 10 years and they get paid millions of dollars. And they're much, much better at it. Because you can train an algorithm to see millions of images all over the world. The best human can see a thousand images in his lifetime. And we're getting to some really, really weird experiments here. There was a paper that was published by Stanford University last year that received really, really kind of weak, dodgy reception because they published last year that their image recognition algorithms can recognize gay people on photos with 81% accuracy. 
it opens up some really ethical questions that are, you know, interesting for this, just from a photo. And this is where kind of, you know, we, we're getting this image recognition that's way, way better than humans can do, but it's also in some cases way, way stupider than humans can ever be. So I'd like to introduce to you two lovely girls called Alicia and Alison Kennedy. They, they grew up in Georgia, and if you've ever been to Georgia, you know that kind of the U.S. state, not the, the European country, if kind of you know that pedestrians are illegal in Georgia. Basically, everybody drives a car there, and the first thing you do when you're 16 years old, you go and get a driver's license. So these two girls in 2015, living in a place called Evans, Georgia, they go and get, to, to want to kind of get a, uh, um, a driver's license to take a test, and the, the, they sign a form, they take the photos, the computer accepts one of their applications, and it says, Alison has to go and sign the application again. It cannot scan the, the signature. So Alison goes and signs the application again. Then she hands in her scan. The lady behind the counter scans it, and she said, okay, now the computer is saying Alicia's application is an invalid photo. She needs to go and take a photo again. So she goes and takes a photo again. They put that in the system. The computer says, okay, now Alison's kind of application is wrong because of something else. After about five tries, the computer says, fuck it. I'm not doing this anymore and pops up a dialogue that says, call headquarters. And the lady behind the counter calls the headquarters, and there's a lot of, mmm, yeah, yeah, no, mmm. And then the girls hear something about an anti-terrorism database. It's like, woo! So the lady apologizes for not being able to take the application and sends them back home, and because pedestrians are illegal, they make a big fuss out of that. But some news agencies get involved, and they do a bit of research what happened there, actually. And it turns out that kind of this computer was connected to another computer, it 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 was connected to an anti-terrorism database, because everything is connected to everything these days. And there's a kind of anti-terrorism image recognition computer that thought that these two girls that are twins were the same person. And he said, oh, you know, we have the same person applying under two different names to get the driver's license. This must be a terrorist attack. There's no other explanation for it, ever. And kind of this is completely insane. You know, you and I can see that they're not the same person. But this kind of, you know, hidden computer in the background said terrorist. So this is kind of where, you know, we, we need to start figuring out new edge cases for this stuff. It's, it's all good and fine. We can recognize gay people and leukemia, but we can't recognize twins. You know, how, how, this is the umlaut equivalent. This is, this is silly. This is just silly. So, kind of, I think w w with the whole, you know, uh, AI and machine learning, we, we have to figure out, you know, how do we describe correctness? Because correctness becomes a lot more difficult to describe. For about 20 years, we've, all our testing practices are, this is what I expect, this is correct. There's a wonderful documentary on Netflix called AlphaGo, that's about kind of the uh, deep mind al algorithm that won at the Go Championship, uh, that won against Lee Sedol, who was number two at Go. So the computer won the first game easily, so there were lots of kind of big stakes for the second game. And in the second game, they had two news coverage rooms. One was a Korean news coverage room, one was English, and the computer makes a stupid mistake. The Korean news coverage room starts celebrating, and they say, not even a Korean child would make such a stupid mistake. This computer was programmed by Europeans, you can see that. In the development room, you have people panicking. People are going through logs. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on. There's um, Eric Schmidt from Google. Is it Eric Schmidt from Google? Yeah, he's there yelling at the developers. Kind of, it's, it's all insane. It's, it's all panic because the computer, it's such a high-stakes game, made a childish mistake. Ten minutes later, the computer easily wins the game, and it turns out that that childish mistake was the pivotal moment in the game. Because the computer can see much, much farther ahead than anybody else. So, you know, we, we have something where all the, all the Go experts in the world are saying, this is a stupid mistake, but the computer knows what's correct. So, doing this kind of software now that everybody seems to be really interested about makes it really difficult to express correctness. And this is where our existing testing practices, testing tools, testing ideas that look for correctness make it really difficult to, to kind of say what's quality. So, kind of, the next question that we need to talk about is where is the risk in our software? And where is a geographic question? It's a question of mapping, like Simon said. And 
I think about kind of where in terms of a geographic location, so I can tell you 100% that the risk is in Potwin, Kansas, which is here on the map. Potwin is a brilliant place in, in the middle of Kansas that has a population of 436 people in 2014. I can bet it's not changed a lot till today. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not even lots of computers in Potwin. But this is where the risk is. Um, so, uh, uh, an elderly couple called James and Theresa Arnold moved into Potwin because they wanted to move away from the buzz of a city. They rented a farm in Potwin that's nowhere, literally nowhere. You have to drive outside of Potwin, and then there's a dirt road, and then you drive by the dirt road, you see kind of a gate to their farm, then you drive for 10 minutes, and then you get to them. So, about a week after they moved in, they had kind of uh, some people phoning them to say that they need to disable the spam filters because this person somewhere in Australia cannot send emails because of them. At this point, the Potwins didn't even have a computer. It's really difficult to have a spam filter without a computer. So, kind of a week later, they got visited by the US Secret Service looking for stolen government laptops. A week later, they got visited by the FBI trying to find some drug deal gone bad. Um, a week later, they got visited by another government agency, another police, and this got so bad that the sheriff of Potwin, yes, they actually have a fucking sheriff in Potwin, the sheriff of Potwin nailed a sign in front of their farm saying if any government agency wants to arrest the Arnolds, to come to talk to him first. So, this went completely crazy. People were calling them about suicide attempts. Somebody, in, in an act of revenge for an unknown crime, left a shitty toilet seat in front of their house. Um, and kind of, they were really, really confused about this until a brilliant journalist working for a magazine called Fusion, called Kashmir Hill, called them and said, Hey, are maybe weird things happening to you? He said, yeah, how'd you know? So Kashmir Hill worked on this story based on an elderly couple in New York that got similar stuff but on a smaller scale, where the police was coming in and breaking their doors all the time and things like that. And she kind of started following up a story and, and figured out that this um, uh, elderly couple had a very unusual kind of geo-mapping bug assigned to their house, that lots of the police came to their house looking for kind of geo, uh, after geo-mapping, and then the, she kind of tried to find more people that have weird stuff happening to them, and she found a guy called Anthony Pav. Anthony Pav lived in a different place. He lived in a place called Ashburn, Virginia. Kind of, I, I've done a bit of research where he actually lives, so I think this is his house. So at the end of a cul-de-sac in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. And Ashburn is this quiet residential place. There's you know, 50,000 people living there, most are middle class, they work in Washington mostly for the government or kind of government agencies. Anthony came back one day, driving by, you know, by his cul-de-sac and found this Robocop police SWAT trying to kick, kick his door in. He said, wait, 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 I'll open the door, just don't break anything. So they went in, they turned his house apart, they tore up all the furniture and everything, and then they didn't find anything and said sorry and left. And they said they were looking for this stolen government laptop. A few days later, Kashmir found, called Anthony and said, are weird things happening to you? He said, yeah, how'd you know? Like a couple of days ago, we had this. So she kind of, she uh, figured that Anthony lived uh, in Ashburn, Virginia. This big, big kind of empty space there is a Facebook data center. Next to it, there's a Google data center. And Google Cloud operates from there because this is close to the US government. And kind of what happened there is whenever people steal a laptop or something like that, the laptop tries to phone back home. If the laptop was using a VPN using Google Cloud, phones back home means they get an IP address of Google Cloud. And the police was using this software that's providing geomapping that's not entirely correct. And it's taking a source from MaxMind. MaxMind um, is a company that's providing a rough geolocation for an IP address, but they don't provide physical addresses. So there's another piece of software that said, oh, this geolocation is this physical address. Now, you and I know that IP addresses were never meant to be physical locations. 
with broadband, they started becoming physical locations, but that's not always entirely correct. Most of the time it is. So what had happened is we have a whole sequence of errors there. Max mind, if they didn't know where exactly something is, but they knew it's in Ashburn, they would put it in the geographic middle of Ashburn, which meant that there was about a million or so IP addresses pointing to Anthony Pav's house that was in the middle of Ashburn. And kind of, when they started unwrapping the whole story, she hired some tech guy to go through the Maxman database and see are there other people with this stuff. And if, they, if Maxman knew that an IP address was in the US but not where exactly in the US, it would put it smack in the middle of US geographically, which was the farm of James and Therese Arnold. They had 600 million IP addresses assigned to them without ever owning a computer. That's amazing. So uh, we, we have this whole kind of sequence of errors there. And, and the big question is who's guilty at this point? Sorry. Because MaxMind never ever guaranteed that they're giving people a, a, a physical address. They were saying where approximately this is. Somebody else was transforming it into something else. So the big problem with this stuff is our industry is becoming an API marketplace. I buy data from you, I sell it to somebody else, I integrate with this service or integrate with that service, and we have kind of this whole problem where the risk really shifts from units to integration. The risk is no longer in my unit of code because I'm integrating with a ton of other things. And again, we're used to humans using our stuff, so we defend against a human putting in wrong data. We have user input validation. How many of you have third-party data in your system? And how many of you do you actually trust that third-party data blindly? We were used to trusting third-party data. Why? Why would third-party data have to be correct? I mean, that, that's insane. So we need to think about these algorithms completely differently and rethink the whole thing. There's a famous case of the St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Rapids, Massachusetts. In 2003, during a botched IT migration from a legacy system to a new system, because they messed up whether some identifier is alphanumeric or numeric, they declared about 5% of the population in Grand Rapids as dead by mistake. And because everything is integrated with everything else, they send their data to the government, to the insurance companies, to everybody who just said, oh, the hospital said 8,500 people died this morning. <laughs> That's okay. You know, we just cancel insurance policies, you know, cancel the driver's licenses and everything. So we're coming kind of to this space where because everything is connected with everything else, we have to stop trusting third-party data. So, kind of the next thing that's really, really interesting that we need to start thinking about is when do risky things happen? And one of the things that's happening with kind of the whole API marketplace changing, um, or, or the IT changing in an API marketplace, is we're getting this thing where we're dependent a lot more on other people. Simon talked about serverless this morning. I, I, I built an app where we were one of the early adopters of that. We deploy, I'm, I'm incredibly happy with the whole thing. But we depend on the Amazon infrastructure now so much more than we used to do that kind of the risk is actually in other people changing stuff when we don't know about that. A couple of years ago, kind of this app I'm building um, is, is actually one of the key benefits of that. It was very nicely integrated with Google Drive. That's, that was one of our competitive advantages. And I was doing this conference talk in Spain, flying through Paris, and I had about three hours stopover in Paris. Three hours is just enough to kind of come down from Charles de Gaulle into the center of Paris, go into a really nice restaurant, go back to the airport, and enjoy kind of the stopover. Now, I land in Paris, I turn on my phone, I have 2,000 mes email messages from our monitoring system. Everything's gone, tits up. So the whole kind of, you know, enjoy a nice lunch in Paris plan goes away. And I start looking at what happened. And while I was in the plane, Google released a new version of this API where they changed the order of messages. We were expecting the order of messages to be this. They changed it around. Now we're no longer waiting for people to kind of sign in correctly. Everything explodes. So, you know, I can test my app as much as I want before deployment. But the risk really shifts, so when we start moving things to the cloud, the risk shifts to kind of from before deployment to after deployment. Five, ten years ago, 
Testing in production was a, a derogatory term for people that didn't know how to do their quality. Oh, these idiots are testing in production. Oh, ha, 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 ha. Kind of testing in production is now the most responsible thing you can do if you're deployed on the cloud. Because 90% of the risk isn't in your app. 90% of the risk is in somebody else changing something else after your app is deployed. And this opens up a whole different set of questions we need to ask. Kind of, um, so I think you know, we need to start thinking about how we monitor, how we investigate errors that happen after deployment, how we look for patterns, trends, how we look for problems. And this is really difficult because you know, errors do happen in production, not because we are at fault. I had this really weird email coming a couple of years ago where somebody complained that my app doesn't work when they lock it on a Samsung fridge. <laughs> you never designed for that. So, you know, people will use ad blockers, they will use content blockers and complain that your app doesn't work. They will try to use your app in Internet Explorer 3. They will kind of this weird stuff that causes the app not to work in production. But, you know, if all of a sudden failed sign-ins jump 10 times, there's something wrong. So we need to kind of come up with much, much better heuristics for doing something like that. Now, kind of the next question that we need to think about is how do our users interact with us? And I think this is changing as well. And in order to show you that, I'm going to play a short video. So do we have the sound running? So this is from a, a very nearby. It's, it's a Robbie the Robot teaching Hungarian children how to dance. Sok ilyen filmet csinálnak arról, hogy a robotok, robotok ugye átveszik az irányítást a föld fölött. Szerintem ez nem igaz, mert most is itt látható Robi e, úgy, hasán, látható a rendőrség jele. E, szerintem majd az emberiség javát fogja szolgálni. First of all, you know, hey, something has a police emblem on it, so we trust it, yeah? So, you know, we, we, the, the, the social engineering doesn't really come into the play there. That's okay. So the second thing I really like about this is he's telling children not to put their ID numbers on social networks. So I'm impressed that in Hungary, even children have ID numbers, you know, I, or, or he's talking complete rubbish. And, and the third thing, okay, you know, this kid might be kind of overly enthusiastic about robots not taking over the world. So this is Robby the robot. He is a Hungarian police robot, making him a Robocop, a real one. He looks fucking scary to me. <laughs> you know, and, and, and you know, we, we, we're moving away from keyboards, we're moving from screens, we have people interacting with this. I, I love the fact that the Hungarian police use this robot to actually hold a press conference. That's completely insane. I have no fucking idea what he said, but I wouldn't really like to be the guy he's pointing at here. So. We, we have, you know, we, we're starting to move away from keyboards and screens. We're moving away to different interfaces, which we have no idea how to test. And kind of, okay, fair enough, maybe we're not going to be talking to robots all the time, but there's this stuff. Lots of people have this in their homes. I have this in my home, and it's wonderful because my children are talking to it all the time. I've outsourced parenting. This thing reads stories to my children. It plays music. When my daughter gets angry, she kind of shakes it and yells at it. And it's, it's wonderful. The technology behind it is amazing. It can recognize my voice in broken English. It can recognize my daughter's voice. She can't pronounce all the sounds. It can recognize, you know, noise from other noise. It's amazing stuff. It can play music from you. It can, you know, give you useful information. And, and you know, it's children who are starting to play with this. They're discovering a completely new natural interface. 
They don't like typing. And this is a wonderful, wonderful girl called Brooke Netzel, who um, in 2017 started kind of interacting with their own, her own version of, of Alexa, and she got on national news. A six-year-old girl in Dallas was able to use Amazon's voice-activated Alexa device to order herself up about 200 bucks worth of goodies. She said, Alexa, will you play doll with me? Could you get me a dollhouse? And Alexa did. And then she was like, Alexa, could you give me some cookies? And Alexa did, four pounds worth, showed up at the house. She immediately said, Alexa, I love you. <laughs> I said, of course you do. So this is Brooke with the box of goodies she got back from Alexa. And she got a dollhouse and some cookies worth about $170, just because she asked for it. And this is amazing. Now we have, you know, children ordering stuff online where Amazon is dispatching it and her parents have no idea what's going on and, and you know of course when they complained Amazon gave them the money back but the lovely thing about this is after this picture on CNN they got Brooke to reenact what she did so she played it for the journalists Alexa ordered me a dollhouse and some cookies the ping you heard is the sound of an Alexa waking up. And because this was on the CNN, thousands of Alexas woke up at that time, <laughs> ordered thousands of dollhouses and cookies that Amazon, being incredibly efficient, dispatched on the next five minutes. So. We have edge cases here that we have no idea about. We have, how do you test a voice device? And now, again, you can think to yourself, okay, we, we don't have to worry about this. We don't work for Amazon. We don't allow children to order doghouses. We're a big bank or we're a big insurance company. But kind of my big bank started moving away from keyboards and screens to voice and video. I bank with HSBC in the UK. Last year, I got an email saying, hey, we have this wonderful thing for you. You no longer have to enter your password when you want to access your bank account. You can just kind of phone us and, and talk to a computer. It's like, what? And they said, well, look at this video. Voice ID is a new way to access your telephone banking without having to use and remember passwords. Your voice is unique. Our software can analyze over 100 unique features from your pronunciation, to the size and shape of your mouth. It can recognize you even if you have a cold or a sore throat. Now, my wife cannot recognize me when I have a sore throat over the phone. And I've been living with her for a long time. And, and this thing is telling me that a computer can. Maybe, maybe, you know, we have computer that the best computer in the world can recognize radiology images better than the best radiologist. So maybe HSBC computers can recognize my voice better than my voice better than my wife. Maybe. Who knows? And it took the BBC uh, about one day to break this stuff. Would anybody care to guess how they did it? What's an edge case here? Hmm? I replay this on there. They, 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 you know, they expected that. So, you know, they, they're not complete idiots. They're idiots, but not complete idiots. So, what else? Hmm? Record, they said they played that already, so they tried, they, they tested against that. Twins. So, twins are a universal edge case. These are Joe and Dan Simmons. Joe is a journalist for the BBC. Dan is his brother. You know, they kind of <laughs> phoned the bank and his brother was able to log in. Now, what this means is that the best thing you can do if you want to have a career in software testing in the future is to become a twin. <laughs> you will be able to spend your siblings' money. You're not going to be able to get a driving license, but that's okay. You'll have lots of money. So, you know, there's good and bad things about that. So, I think, you know, once we move away from keyboards and screens to a different interface, the whole thing shifts. And the first thing that needs to shift is, I think, you know, for a long time, we did this thing where, oh, you do your unit tests and most of your stuff is a unit test and a bit of integration. This thing. If most of the risk is integration, the testing pyramid that's been kind of the best practice for the last 20 years has to change. Kind of, that's not where the risk is. The risk is somewhere else. And kind of we need to start thinking about 
no longer doing predictive testing because it might be difficult to assert correctness. If the best players for Go in the world think this is a mistake, but it's actually okay, what chance does a software tester have against it? So we need to start moving away from predictive testing to active monitoring. And there's a, there's a lovely uh, thing that I read about um, for, for um, developed for a game called No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky is a generative universe game. Um, what that means is that it's a shared universe where you can fly your spaceship around and it kind of, to keep it interesting, they created about 19 quintillion worlds. I, I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics. I have no clue how much 19 quintillion is. It's a lot. Um, let's assume that, you know, we can spend our entire lifetime testing 19 quintillion worlds. We're still not going to test it correctly. And what they've done is to keep all of these worlds unique. They have some kind of basic data about animals, houses, buildings, and, and kind of trees, and then they mutate it somehow. It's all predictive, but the search space is too big. So on this world, the turtles are going to be red. They're going to walk on two legs. And, you know, the dinosaurs are going to have gazelle legs. And the turtles are going to have a chicken head. On the next world, it's going to be a different mix. So. It's very difficult to assert correctness here, but things can look weird. So what they've done is they've built space probes, very similar to how NASA explores space, that fly through the space, shoot videos of this, and then show it in the developer room as people are building. And then people are developing and say, oh, this looks weird. This animal is not going to be able to stand on these two legs like this. So they pause, they look at the algorithm, they kind of figure out why it's wrong, they rebuild it and go again. So they're going for exploration of their software in production by building in probes. But so, so I think what we're going to have to start moving to is more an approval style testing where the machines are going to help us collect this data and then a human can say, well, ah, maybe it's good, maybe it's bad, or this is obviously bad, or kind of, and we'll need a whole set of different tools to emerge for this. Um, there, there was a lovely presentation, I, I, I unfortunately I forgot the person's name, sorry, from Apply Tools talking about AI in testing and how they're doing visual testing there. And I think we're going to see an emergence of a lot of this stuff in the future. Um, and kind of the next thing that I think we're going to start seeing is a second order of this. We'll be, start seeing algorithms that help us search for problems where the machine is going to collect all this data and then help a human decide what's good or bad. So I, I hope we're going to see a lot of automation emerging to assist humans, not to replace them. That's kind of dealing with reducing the search space of 18 quintillion worlds to just one or two pictures I need to look at. Because if we're talking about monitoring in production, the biggest problem is noise. People logging in with Internet Explorer 3, people logging in with the wrong password, people logging in where they forgot the password, people logging in with their old password, all that is noise. But what Google did to us again, you know, Google being Google, when they released Chrome 64, they broke their own library for third-party website authentication. So all of a sudden, login failures through Google skyrocketed on our monitoring system. So I need something to take away all the noise and to say, this thing happened, explore it. So that, that's where I hope kind of this thing is going to change. So um, that's pretty much it for, for, for this talk. Uh, if you liked any of these stories, there's a lot more in my book, Humans versus Computers. Thank you very much for staying so late. Um, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was really intense. I think we have two minutes for a couple of questions. So okay. feel free to pick the one that you like. So am I surprised that a particular incident hasn't happened yet? I don't know. I, I kind of, you know, lots of really weird stuff happened. Um, so I, I, I read about this um, uh, R Russian variant of Tesla. It's called Unicum. They're not building a self-driving car. They're building a self-driving tank. I think that's where kind of really interesting shit is going to start happening, where kind of, you know, where, where killing a human is a feature, not a bug. Um, we're going to start seeing some really, really interesting technology there. So that's, that's what I kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of. So 
Do you fear more the Hungarian police robot, Robocops, Dub or Terminator? I, I fear Stack Overflow, honestly. <laughs> more than anything there. So I think Stack Overflow is going to cause the apocalypse because somebody's going to copy and paste something that they don't understand <laughs> and, and paste it into, you know, any of these things. So I don't think AI is the problem. I think, you know, human intelligence has not evolved to copy and paste correctly yet. Okay, that's about it. Thanks very much.